Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hello, uh, welcome to the week three of the Nano Hub U course Thermoelectricity from Atoms to Systems. Uh, so far, you have learned on the micro scale how the thermoelectric effect could be defined. Uh, and uh, how you go from that to the macro scale. Before we do more on the theory, uh, we thought that it's good for you to see what actually, uh, how thermoelectric measurements are done that give you an idea of um, uh, what are some of the limitations as we engineer material properties and as we try to do more. Um, so uh, let's quick uh, recap. Uh, a Seebeck effect is a voltage generated under a temperature uh, difference. So whenever you have an electrical conductor, one side of it is hot, the other side cold. There is a voltage generated. The ratio of voltage to temperature was the Seebeck, which was discovered in 1821. And, uh, but in a power generation, this battery needs to be connected to some sort of a load, like a light bulb or something else. So it's not only the voltage that matters, but also the current that comes out. And uh, because the current uh, could dissipate in the material, uh, the material electrical conductivity comes in. And uh, finally, I have a material, one side of it hot, the other side cold. The heat needs to go to the electrons that are then going through the atoms. So as a result, we need to optimize the factor Z that you learned from the first week, which is the CV coefficient squared time electrical conductivity uh, divided by thermal conductivity. So the question is how these three main material parameters is measured. And uh, as we move on to the smaller scale, what are some of the uh, challenges in characterizing these properties. Uh, so let's uh, start with Ohm's law. Um, Georg Ohm uh, in 1827 uh, published a book in which he first uh, 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 proposed that the current should be proportional to the applied voltage. This is what we know as Ohm law and uh, the coefficient is one over resistance. The microscopic version of this is current density proportional to electric field and the proportionality is electrical conductivity. What is interesting is that Ohm uh, got some ideas about to get this proportionality from Fourier, uh, which uh, came out a couple of years earlier, which has to do with thermal conductivity. So uh, what is Fourier law for thermal conductivity? Heat flow Q is proportional to the temperature gradient delta T, um, and the coefficient of proportionality is uh, thermal conductivity. So it's very similar, and from this we can already see an analogy. Temperature is similar to a voltage to, in an electrical measurement. Heat flux is similar to a, a current, and uh, uh, thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity are very much related. Um, again, this uh, first was proposed in 1822, and here we are going to see how this uh, measurement could be done on the uh, small scale. The idea could be simple. I have a carbon nanotube, a very small material made of individual atoms in a sheet that is rolled. Uh, if one side is hot, the other side is uh, hot, the other side is cold. Uh, what is the thermal conductivity? What is the Seebeck value? at which point we see differences between diffusion and uh, ballistic effect. Even though this um, uh, figure looks simple, what is the underlying difficulty is we cannot really measure temperature on the two sides of a very small object. Oh, what is uh, the problem? People have been talking of measuring voltages across a very small area. This is what is called quantum point contact. Um, this has been around uh, in the last 30, 40 years. In a two-dimensional electron gas, one could define a, qu a quantization region for electrons, and by adding a contact on the right and the left, what could measure the electrical transport. And from this, we can see how uh, the voltage at the nanometer scale is quantized. The problem with um, heat is that the same type of measurement for current cannot be done. Um, and the problem uh, is that in this case, we just connect two wires. And um, what we measure with the two wires is actually what is happening here. The difficulty with the heat is that whatever probes we put on the two sides, 
uh, it's very hard to only measure what is in the center. Um, here is a busy graph, but it tells you what is the thermal conductivity of material that exists uh, in nature. Uh, and today we have access to. Um, so near room temperature, which is here, basically we have a range of thermal conductivities that go from maybe 0.1 watt per meter Kelvin up to uh, 1 or 2,000 watt per meter Kelvin. This range is only a factor of 100,000, 10,000 to 100,000. You go from all the way from diamond or graphite down to plastics, uh, PVC, and so on. These variations in thermal conductivity is much smaller than what we have in electrical transport. If I uh, have the same graph for electrical conductivity of material, the range between highest electrical conductivity and lowest electrical conductivity could be different by 20 order of magnitude. This small change in thermal uh, properties of material is one of the biggest problems to measure thermal and thermoelectric properties at small scale. So let's consider an object that we want to measure its temperature and assume we have a thermometer. Again, what is a thermometer is a, a material whose properties changes with temperature and we can calibrate that. Ideally, we say we connect that to our object and between the object and the thermometer should be a low thermal resistance and uh, between the thermometer and the other objects and ambient should be a high thermal resistance. And the biggest problem we have is that the ratio of these two resistances, as we saw in the previous graph, is only a factor of, uh, of 10,000 to 100,000. As a result, because this object is very small, but the rest of the world is very big, it's very hard to neglect um, what is happening with the environment. And that's one of the biggest challenges. That's to measure temperature. How are we characterizing heat transport? The idea is the same. I take a nanometer object, nanoscale object. One side of it, I put a heat source. The other side, I put a reservoir. And the idea is I measure the temperature on one side, temperature on the other side. And from the amount of heat flux and temperature difference, I can measure the thermal conductivity. So the question uh, becomes, um, uh, what are the pr uh, problems here is again the ratio between the thermal resistances that should be small and those that should be big. And again, the, uh, we don't have as much control. The other big problem in the nanoscale is that we really don't have a nanoscale reservoir. Reservoir by definition needs lots of degrees of freedom, lots of atoms, and when the device is nanoscale, um, uh, uh, these uh, larger reservoir could be far away. So in reality, assuming a perfect reservoir on the other side of the nanoscale uh, object uh, is a limitation. Um, so here is a table that tell you how the measurements could be done. It's a busy table, but this is state of the art of how we know how to measure temperature at the micro and some nanoscale. Um, uh, so there are different methods to measure temperature. For each method, what is the resolution in spatial temp uh, resolution in micron? What is the temperature resolution? How fast we can do the measurement? Is an imaging technique or a point measurement? And some of the notes. And um, basically, week three lectures have to do with these methods. Uh, some of the key methods are highlighted, and then we discuss how they're applied to the thermoelectric measurements. The smallest, uh, the simplest uh, way is to measure a micro with a microthermocouple. These are thermocouples on the thickness of a human hair. And with a diameter of 50 micron um, uh, and a relatively slow response, they are probably the most reproducible way to measure temperature because we calibrate this, but the contacting is very important. Then we have a couple of optical techniques like infrared thermography, locking thermography, liquid crystal uh, thermography. Um, uh, these uh, suffer from uh, relatively low temperature, spatial resolution, and um, low uh, time resolution. We spend uh, a good lecture on thermoreflecting techniques because this is a technique that gives us the temperature resolution, especially down to submicron and temporarily down to 800 picosecond with a very good um, uh, temperature resolution. Uh, there are also other techniques that we will uh, review later uh, this week uh, that have to do with interferometry, micro-Raman, and near-field. 
A technique that has been popular in the last 20 years is called scanning thermal microscopy, basically putting a, th a tiny thermocouple at the tip of, the of an atomic force microscope. Spatial resolution can be down to 50 nanometer, uh, is not as fast, and temperature resolution is not as good, but this is one of the ways for us to get the highest spatial resolution, and we have a special lecture on this technique. So let me uh, start uh, with these techniques. Um, uh, of an actual device. Instead of uh, introducing the techniques um, by just saying abstract what they are, I want to give you an example of what a given technique produces for a microscale device. So the microscale device we are considering is a micro refrigerator on a chip. Uh, in uh, some of the lectures, uh, uh, earlier lectures by Professor Landstrom, you saw that um, uh, multi-barrier and single-barrier devices could act as a refrigerator. In this case, we have a 3 micron thick silicon-silicon germanium super lattice. This is one-tenth of the thickness of a human hair. The uh, layers of the silicon and silicon germanium, in this case with little carbon, are chosen that hot electrons move in the material while cold electrons cannot move in the material. And basically, we have a cloud of electrons on one side. And in this cloud of electrons, uh, when we apply a current, the hot ones can easily move, while the cold ones cannot easily move. That process, when you apply a current, there is an evaporative cooling. And that evaporative cooling produces um, a net uh, temperature reduction at the top surface. Here is an actual uh, drawing of a device. Device, again, 50 by 50 micron on the order of size. This is typical size of human hair, and this is also size of the smallest thermocouples you can buy. There is a little metal layer. The idea is that you can send current from the side without leaking to the substrate by putting an insulator, and the electron gas arrives on the top surface. Um, and here, both hot and cold electrons are in equilibrium, but only the hot ones could go down, and uh, the cold ones stay and they cool the surface. This is our test bed to measure different temperature techniques, and we want to see um, uh, how different techniques compare. Uh, this device was first introduced in 97, and this is a review article in 2006 about some of the performances. The easiest way to, to measure temperature is by measuring a thermocouple. This is a picture of this microthermocouple. You can see it can go through the hole of a uh, needle. Um, they are very small, so it's very fragile. It's very hard to manipulate them. But carefully, you can put one of them on top of a device and another one on a reference. By measuring a differential measurement, here is the cooling measured on the device versus current applied. First of all, you can see currents are quite large. This is on the order of 500 or so milliamp, half an amp. Mostly, if you send this much current in any device, you just see pure heating. Uh, you can actually burn a lot of material, uh, small um, bridges. But because electrons that are emitted here are evaporatively cooling, you can see that uh, you can have 4 degree cooling below ambient. And you see very low noise, the noise is uh, below 0.1 degree. And with this tiny thermocouple, this measurement has been done. One thing that this view graph um, doesn't highlight is the difficulty, is to get the reproducible result, the solid-solid uh, contacts are very hard. So you need to put a very tiny amount of thermal paste to make sure that this is reproducible. But uh, once you take care of that, and then there is no airflow for this to move, you can get these results quite reproducibly. One idea is, okay, this thermocouple is as big as the device. I cannot make a temperature image. I just measure one data point for the whole device. How can I get smaller temperature? Uh, in um, early 90s, mid 90s, people started developing scanning thermal microscopy. The whole idea is take an atomic force microscope tip. At the tip, instead of having a single point, let's define a thermocouple junction which is a contact between, for example, chrome and uh, platinum. This Any junction of two metals generate voltage under a temperature difference, so this is a good uh, way to measure temperature. And um, uh, it gives you some numbers about detection limits and so on. These are early works by Li Shi and Arun Majumdar um, in late 90s, early 2000. Um, these uh, tips look very sharp. 
But in reality, when you put such a sharp uh, tip on the surface, um, the measurements are not as clean as one anticipate. What is the problem is when you put a tip on top of a surface, there is always a meniscus layer of water on any surface at ambient condition unless it's ultra high vacuum. Um, also, um, you have roughness on the surface. So really the uh, exchange of heat between the sample and the probe is by multiple methods due to uh, through the water meniscus, through the air conduction near the region, through the radiation. Even though the contact could be a couple of tens of nanometers, the region of interaction could be larger. And that's what makes uh, the analysis very difficult. Um, this method works the best when the surface is very flat. Amazing results have been shown. These are uh, thermal images of uh, scanning thermal microscopy of metallic single wall nanotubes. Basically between two electrodes that are a couple of micron apart, they put a single wall nanotube. Diameter is only one nanometer. Here are the thermal images at different biases. And you can see that at high biases, the device heats up, the nanotube heats up about 2 degree Kelvin. Um, and at lower biases, the heating is low. But what is interesting is you see at lower biases, the heating starts at the contacts, not in the center. This is actually one of the early ways they were able to identify that the contacts are limiting in a ballistic uh, device. Um, so the, this measurement showed the capabilities of scanning thermal microscopy were very small sizes. But remember, what you have here is a nanotube that by definition or by construction is very uh, uh, smooth surface. With the same scanning thermal uh, microscope, Professor Majumda's group at Berkeley tried to measure temperature on one of these micro-refrigerators. Here so you have a square of a micro-refrigerator. Here is current zero, current 200 milliamp. By looking at it, the color and the numbers, you can see this is cooling about two, two and a half degrees. But the big difficulty is you see a lot of artifacts. And a lot of cases you have a contrast while the temperature should be uniform. Why is it? Because this is a realistic sample and the surface is rough and the roughness is more than the tip um, radius. As a result, you have artifacts due to the surface roughness. And that's something is very hard to deal with unless you uh, uh, try to prepare the surface. Let me summarize what you learned in this lecture. We briefly discuss what are the Fourier and Ohm's law for heat conduction and electrical conduction. The idea that there is a lot of analogy, measuring electrical resistivity at the nanoscale is relatively easy, uh, but measuring thermal conductivity and temperature on a small scale is hard, has to do with the range of how much um, uh, material thermal conductivity and thermal property changes. We discuss thermal characterization techniques, the microthermocouple and the scanning thermal microscopy. Um, so this is one of the early uh, uh, kind of overviews. In the next lectures, we see some of the uh, more advanced uh, versions of the scanning thermal microscopy, how we really can go to the nanoscale, and then some of the optical techniques. Um, look forward to see you at lecture number two.